Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is William Jenkins, and I'm an affiliated faculty member of the City Institute at York University here in what's a rather rainy Toronto. I was until nine days ago the interim director of the Institute, so it's a pleasure to welcome back our director, Professor Linda Peake, from her sabbatical. Our institute was established as an organized research unit at the university in 2006, and we're a community of affiliated professors, graduate students, senior undergrads, postdoctoral fellows, uh, and visiting scholars who all share an interest in collaborative interdis interdisciplinary and critical urban research. Our researchers are currently engaged in funded projects that examine issues of urbanization and gender in the global south, suburbanization issues, housing issues in Canada and other parts of the world, the phenomenon of a smart city, for example, and of course, research on uh, several themes affecting the uh, Toronto region. Our affiliates cover a wide range of disciplines uh, from civil engineering and law over to things like art history, for example. And speaking of the Toronto region, and although we are not all gathered, in the one place uh, right now. I'd like to acknowledge that many Indigenous nations in this part of Canada have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University's campuses currently stand. And the area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Métis and Inuit communities, and we acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to share and care for the Great Lakes region. And so to today's seminar, well, in addition to my involvement in the City Institute, I'm also an Associate Professor in the Department of History at York, and so I am especially intrigued and looking forward to this seminar, which we have titled um, The Digital Urban Past, yeah, GIS Through the Centuries, which is uh, a bit better than the original title, which was all you ever wanted to know about digital spatial history, which you were afraid to ask. Um, so if you are a curious urbanist, a curious historian, curious about georeferencing, geocoding, and the development of GIS-friendly urban um, historical databases, and uh, you've come to the right place. Uh, or if you're like me, somebody trained originally in historical geography, but who was yet to get to grips uh, with historical GIS, um, you are also in the right place. At least I managed to get um, my map of my hometown of Dublin in Ireland behind me here on the, on the poster. So we have three presentations uh, this afternoon on the cities of Florence, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and London. Uh, we also have the benefit of a moderator, and I am delighted to introduce my colleague from the history department, uh, Sean Carrage. Sean is an associate professor of Canadian and environmental history, and is also associate dean for, of programs in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. Uh, Sean's current research examines the social and environmental consequences of the development and uh, operation of oil pipelines in Canada. He has undertaken a preliminary work on the history of oil pipeline spills and is now exploring the historical, social, economic and environmental consequences of onshore oil spills documented on the website, Silent Rivers of Oil, a history of oil pipelines in Canada since 1947. Sean's also the director of the Network in Canadian History and Environment where he hosts and produces Nature's Past, a monthly audio podcast about the environmental history research community in Canada. He also knows a fair bit about GIS, himself, does Sean. And you can find him at seancourage.com. So over to Sean. Thank you for the warm welcome, Willie, and welcome, everybody. I'm happy to be the moderator for this session today and excited to get to the presentations because we've got three um, really interesting projects that span uh, different geographies and different times um, and show some of the ways in which GIS can be used to understand spatial relations uh, across the centuries. So our speakers today uh, include uh, three researchers. Um, the first uh, speaker will be Jim Clifford, Associate Professor of History at the University 
University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Jim is an environmental and urban historian of Britain, Canada, and the British world during the long 19th century. During uh, using digital methods, including historical GIS, text mining, and augmented reality, his research team has explored industrialization in Greater London and the Global Commodities Project London's Ghost Acres, 1850 to 1919, which is focused mainly on the intersections between environmental, social, and political histories. He's the author of the book West Ham and the River Lee, A Social and Environmental History of London's Industrialized Marshland, 1839 to 1914, which was published in 2018. Jim is also a graduate, an alumni from uh, York's uh, graduate program in history, uh, where he gained his PhD in 2011. Um, the second speaker will be Alida Metcalf, uh, who is the Harris Masterson Junior Professor of History at Rice University in Houston, uh, Texas, United States of America. Uh, she is the author of Family and Frontier in Colonial Brazil, which was published in 1992. Uh, also the author of Go-Betweens and the Colonization of Brazil, published in 2005. And the author of Mapping an Atlantic World, circa 1500, published just last year in 2020. And uh, with Eve M. Duffy, uh, co-author of uh, The Return of Hans Staden, A Go-Between in the Atlantic World, published in 2012. Uh, with Fares El Dada, she developed a digital humanities project, Imagine Rio, which maps and illustrates the social and urban evolution of Rio de Janeiro from 1500 to the present. And her current research uh, looks at the history of water in Rio, and recent articles have been uh, concerned with the location and roots of aqueducts in the city in the 19th century. Finally, our uh, last speaker will be Colin Rose, uh, who is an assistant professor of history uh, at Brock University. He's a historian of early modern Europe, specifically of Northern Italy in the 16th and 17th centuries. As a social historian, he's concerned with the ways that communities of ordinary Italians managed their day-to-day -day conflicts and crises and adapted to new forms of governance and power that emerged with the consolidation of ducal states in the region. He has co-edited the book Mapping Space, Sense and Movement in Florence, Historical GIS and the Early Modern City, published in 2016, uh, for which uh, he co-authored co three chapters in that collection. Um, he's also authored the book A Renaissance of Violence, Homicide in Early Modern Italy, which was published in uh, October of 2019. Collins currently the co-principal investigator of Decima, a GIS mapping tool that allows historians to explore Florence's evolving urban dynamics. So we are lucky to have three experts here to share with us their experiences with uh, GIS and their historical research of urban pasts. And I'll turn things over to Professor Clifford to start things off. Okay, hopefully you've got my slides up in front of you now. So today I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of uh, what's now, I guess, about 15 years of research since I first uh, learned about HGIS after returning from my first uh, trip to an archive in 2007. So just to give you a, a quick overview of how I'm going to approach this, uh, I think probably in contrast to some members of the City Institute, I like a lot of historians mostly use a handful of simple features and tools in GIS software. Uh, I have done uh, a big project in geoparsing, but that was not really focused on urban history. So in terms of my urban history research, I mostly create polygons, points and lines and link them with qualitative, quantitative and temporal data. Sometimes this involves geo-referencing maps, and sometimes I'm just creating very simple points to identify where the port of uh, Montreal and, and Quebec City are. Uh, I rarely use geo-processing tools. Most of the times I just don't have the right kind of data, or I'm not confident enough in the data that I have to do any kind of uh, sophisticated geo-processing analysis. And then secondly, I also just don't often have historical questions that require these tools. So simple GIS, GIS tools allow me to make a lot of spatial connections using transnational, uh, including transnational connections. They would be uh, very difficult to kind of figure out without these digital tools. And I also find that GIS is a great tool for exploring data and thinking spatially. So I, I use it quite a lot 
basically for spatial note taking uh, as I try to figure out what the patterns are in the, the material I'm working with. And uh, until the end of this presentation, that will be the last of me reading text off a slide at you. So I'll just start with uh, my, my dissertation and then book project, which uh, you know, really kind of asked a pretty simple question. How did the landscape of the Lower Lee Valley uh, in the suburb of West Ham transform from this kind of bucolic uh, rural landscape at the beginning of the 19th century into uh, this industrial wasteland by the end of the 19th century. So those are two of the images I was presented with quite early in my trip uh, to, to West Ham for the first time. Uh, and I, I kind of knew the basic industrial history from work done by John Marriott, but I really wanted to understand in detail how the landscape transformed over the course of the century. And the first thing that the archivist brought out to me were these huge uh, five feet to the mile uh, ordnance survey maps. Uh, the first survey of this region was done in about 1867 to 1870, and that was resurveyed in 1893 and 1894. And as you can see, when I zoom into this map, we have just incredible detail uh, of what the landscape looks like, at least in this one point in time. Uh, with all the problems that, that this kind of official map brings with them, especially uh, with a dynamic uh, industrial sector where places are going in and out of business quite quickly. Uh, so at first look, you could see how the landscape was filling in, but it was very difficult to sit there with a finger on both maps to try and see uh, how the landscape was changing, especially at the scale these maps are about about one meter by one meter. So just taking in all this information was, was nearly impossible. Uh, coming back from the trip, I uh, had lunch with Bill Turkel at a conference and he told me I had to learn GIS. I, at that point was very definitely not a digital historian and had no idea what GIS was, but I, I took him up on this challenge and uh, spent about six months teaching myself GIS and then relied heavily on uh, Marcel at the University of Toronto Library to fill in some of the gaps. There wasn't a lot of opportunities for history students to learn this stuff back in 2007, 2008. But over time, I've managed to amass a, a database that I think identifies almost every significant factory, factory large enough to be uh, on the maps in Greater London in these two time points in the second half of the 19th century. So. One thing this allowed me to show in the book, especially as I scaled this up to have all the factories in Greater London, was just how much West Ham developed into the center of industry in Greater London during a period where previous historians had argued London had gone through a period of deindustrialization because shipbuilding had collapsed on the Isle of uh, Dogs in East London. Uh, but really what had happened is a lot of industry had migrated east or been established in West Ham, an area that is not included in the census figures for uh, the County of London. So people looking at the census missed this uh, pretty significant industrialization on the East during edge of London. Again, John Marriott had already pointed this out, but I was able to do it in a much more comprehensive way using GIS. Uh, nothing's terribly sophisticated here. We just have polygons showing the location of factories mm -hmm. with some basic additional information like the name on the map and, and my category that I uh, broke these different factories down into. So the soap factories under soap, candle, tallow, and oil works. Now, maps can raise as many questions as they answer. So as you can see in this map, it's pretty startling how one side of the map is almost entirely industrialized and the other side is still open marshland. Uh, so we have a few spots throughout the Lower Lee Valley where this happened. Here again, up in uh, Stratford, a little bit north of that last map, we see factories going up the Waterworks River on the east and not on the western side. This isn't a jurisdictional boundary. This is all within the region of, of West Ham. And so it took, uh, going back to the archive, the, the GIS doesn't answer this question for me. I had to find other sources that explained the Waterworks River was becoming increasingly impassable uh, 
towards the end of the 19th century is so much garbage and waste was dumped into it and it wasn't properly dredged that uh, uh, industrial development kind of ground to a halt on the northern uh, parts of the, the Lower Lee Valley. So that was my use of sort of uh, qualitative analysis of, of the expansion of industrialization and its limits. I also did some very basic work uh, with quantitative information looking at uh, infant mortality. So I, I didn't do the, the micro data approach that some urban historians, especially in the United States, uh, have been able to do with the incredibly detailed um, yeah. census work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I am able to show, and this is an important thing I added into the book, that West Ham had been a relatively healthy suburb in the same range as Kensington, or uh, uh, Lambeth, for example, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, it became very unhealthy, more unhealthy than Poplar, uh, almost as unhealthy as Shoreditch, more unhealthy than Bentho Green. And then something happens in the first decade of the 19th century where many of these uh, boroughs uh, aggressively start to address urban public health issues. And we can see that West Ham follows this wider trend, significantly improving its health outcomes for the most vulnerable members of its society. Uh, so GIS, again, didn't necessarily answer the question why, but it was really important to help situate what was happening in West Ham in this broader process that was happening across not just Greater London, but much of the UK during the first decade of the 19th century when uh, more uh, government intervention really starts to tackle public health issues. So here I'm going to show you how I pivoted from this uh, urban environmental and uh, health history of West Ham to uh, looking at global commodities. So I first became uh, kind of interested in this question after reading John Tolley's uh, really fascinating article about uh, the collapse of the gutta purchase supply that was necessary for building underwater telegraph cables. And I knew from the mapping work I had already done that there were all kinds of interesting factories along Silvertown, which is uh, where uh, West Ham meets the Thames. Uh, and it was a very good place for large factories because you could uh, unload directly from ocean going ships. So building off Tully's work, I started looking at the Silvertown Soap Works, which is actually called John Knight's, uh, John Knight and Son Soap Works, this very large factory on, on the eastern edge of Greater London. And I began exploring its uh, supply chain over the course of its growth in the 19th century from uh, the 1830s through to the end of the century. Uh, in the 1830s, almost all the imported tallow comes from Russia. This starts to change uh, by the 1870s, and you can see Russia is no longer supplying any tallow by the turn of the 20th century, with Australasia being the main source, along with some coming out of the United States and uh, the Argentine Republic. So again, here, I'm not using anything really sophisticated uh, in terms of GIS, but it allows me to start mapping these uh, transnational shifts in uh, the, the different environments that were supplying the growth of London's industry uh, during the 19th century. And with the uh, remaining time, I'm gonna show you the work that I've been doing with Stéphane Cassignet at the University of Quebec at Trois-Rivières for the past uh, three or four years now, uh, where we're focused on the connections between the St. Lawrence uh, watershed, so the St. Lawrence Valley itself, but also the Ottawa Valley and the Great Lakes during the 19th century and uh, urban development across Britain, but uh, still with a particular focus on London. So how do you build London to be the largest city in the world in an island with very few trees? In part, you use a lot of stone and bricks, uh, but you still need a lot of timber, as you can see in this sketch of the construction of the uh, British Museum, all these logs in the foreground, where did those logs come from? So again, I'm sure most people are familiar with just how much London grew in the 19th century, but this map from my book gives you a, a quick 
visualization of that really dramatic increase from about a million to a little bit over 6 million and the significant uh, spread of London uh, even beyond its boundaries, its expanded mid 19th century boundaries. In addition to simply the growth of housing, uh, public buildings, uh, warehouses and factories, this is also uh, the, the railroad boom years, particularly in the 1830s and 1840s, but uh, continuing on after that, and then just the maintenance of railroads uh, demand a lot of timber for the sleepers, uh, fencing, rolling stock, and many other uses. So where did the timber come from? Uh, until the Napoleonic War, most of the timber had come from the Baltic region, from Norway, uh, Prussia, Poland, uh, Sweden, and Russia. Uh, but as you can see in this uh, Excel chart, uh, it's increasingly coming from British North America uh, during the first half of the 19th century because of a tariff that's put in place to stimulate this growth and uh, basically improve Britain's timber security uh, in the first half of the 19th century. So we wanted to go from uh, that sort of simplistic chart, chart where we can show the shift from uh, the Baltic to British North America to start really understanding where in uh, British North America the timber comes from, while also paying attention to the reality that this is actually Algonquin territory and Inuit territory uh, in, in large part where the, the timber was sourced and it was unseated. Uh, the Algonquin did not sign a treaty. That process is actually ongoing uh, right now. So we've been able to chart uh, sites where timber extraction was discussed. And in particular, in this map, you can see uh, the squares, the red squares show that British demand for red pine uh, at a higher value than white pine pushed uh, the logging camps deeper and deeper into Algonquin territory in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, and 50s uh, as they uh, went looking for this timber that was uh, not as available in the regions closer to Montreal and uh, what became Ottawa City. Uh, each of these points is also just a note-taking system where we have the source, uh, the quotes, the year, the uh, commodity that we're interested in. So it's a very useful tool beyond just mapping to assemble all the information from many different sources. And we have a similar map on the eastern, uh, east of Quebec City, showing the push up into Innu territory uh, in the Saguenay and Lac Saint-Jean region in the 1840s and 1850s as spruce steels became one of the major exports commodities uh, and William Price uh, gained kind of a monopoly around this region. Again, with the uh, detailed notes included for each of these points that we've established where either a mill was built or we know they were sourcing timber. Uh, the final example I'll show you is this map we were able to create from a source called the Timber Trades Journal that included a, a weekly list of every timber ship coming into any ports in the United Kingdom. Uh, so for this map, we've just isolated all the ships coming into the London ports and identified uh, where they came from and how much timber they were carrying. And uh, this actually kind of surprised us to the extent the Montreal was the largest timber port exporting in the 18, late 1890s. We knew that the Canadian timber exports continued much stronger than the historiography uh, suggested. While well, Sweden and Russia grew as exporters and they grew to surpass Canada as the uh, two largest exporters of timber to London, what happened is Canadian timber more or less flatlined instead of uh, doing a steep decline after the tariffs ended in the 1860s. And because of the geography, uh, most of the timber is going through Montreal. There's only a handful of ports still exporting to London uh, from, the, from Canada at this point after Confederation. Uh, so it's by far the largest timber exporting port. Uh, and without GIS, the ability to uh, process that and map it, it would have been quite difficult to really visualize the extent uh, and, and why Sweden well, it might be the largest exporter. It has many, many more ports uh, 
all up and down uh, the Baltic. So here's that map just in slightly more of a zoom. So I will conclude uh, with, I think things that won't sound too surprising to historians, but maybe to other members of the uh, community here, that finding, interpreting, sorting, organizing historical information out of the archive is still central to what I do with historical GIS. This is the hard part and it's what takes most of my time and effort. Uh, so basically I'm using GIS software like we use spreadsheets and along spreadsheets. Sometimes uh, a project requires a proper SQL database and some scripting in Python uh, when the scale gets large enough, but most of the time we're working with much smaller data sets that we've pulled out of the archival record. Uh, high levels of geographic accuracy is sometimes not in that, that important when we're not really building a digital model of historical city. Uh, so I always keep in mind the historical questions that I'm trying to answer and let them dictate the tools I use. Uh, and I really try not to let the tools drive the questions that I ask. So there are historians out there that are using much more sophisticated uh, elements of uh, GIS, uh, especially with some of the incredibly rich American data that we're now starting to get access to in other parts of the world uh, to do really good history of public health analysis, looking at race and class and geography and how they all correlate to create uh, sort of regions of, of inequality. Uh, but for a lot of what historians are doing, both in urban uh, history and in other uh, approaches, we, we really just need lines, points, and polygons connected to some relatively uh, straightforward data and the ability to visualize that information becomes incredibly powerful without uh, getting into more sophisticated geoprocessing tools. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, we will turn things over now to Professor Metcalf. Thank you very much for this invitation. I've never been to York University, so it's nice to at least come via Zoom. And thank you everyone who's here. Today, I'm gonna to talk about Imagine Rio, which is a digital mapping and image visualization platform that we've developed at Rice University. Okay. So hang on a second, I've got to move my controls. Okay. So I would like to uh, begin with addressing one of William's questions that he sent us ahead of the event. Uh, and his question was about interdisciplinarity. And I wanted to really begin with that because Imagine Rio began out of a collaboration, a collaboration between myself, I'm a historian, a social historian by training, and my colleague Faraz Aldada, who is an architect uh, and taught in the School of Architecture. And so when I arrived at Rice University 11 years ago, he and I were the only two Brazilianists. And we decided it would be fun to do a project together on Brazil and we settled on Rio. And at the time, neither one of us knew anything about the digital humanities except really obvious things. But we decided that we were going to find a way to map Rio's rich iconography and also its uh, historical maps. And so that was really the way in which Imagine Rio began. And the interdisciplinary collaboration was really essential. OK, so here. Well, I want to talk about first the original version of Imagine Rio, which emphasized a historically accurate map, a historically accurate base map, I should say, and it's accurate down to the year. And this map is enhanced with georeferenced maps and geolocated images. The web version for Imagine Rio was designed by Axis Maps and it used raster tiles, making it possible to generate an infinite number of maps depending on the year selected, the positioning of the map, the zoom level, and so forth. And so this speaks to a second one of William's questions, which was, you know, what challenges have you faced? And this was a big challenge 
for axis maps. Uh, David Heyman, who has been our cartographer, reflected recently that this was the first project that he worked on where the map was always changing. Usually in historical projects he'd worked on, there was a map for one year and then maybe a map 50 years later or 10 years later or what have you. But in Imagine Rio, what we were doing was making the map uh, change every single year. And so that was a big challenge for them to, uh, to, to figure out, uh, which of course they did, making it possible to select any year um, from the 1500 to the present in the history of Rio and the Guanabara Bay. And you'd be able to see what it actually looked like. And this was really important for Rio because the landscape has changed a lot. There have been many landfills uh, and you know hills have come down. And so for the historian, using a modern map is really uh, difficult because the way the city looks today, just in terms of its geography is very different from the way that it looked in the past. So another way in which collaboration has been really important is our current collaboration with the Instituto Moreira Sales, which is a museum in Brazil. And they have an amazing collection of historical photographs by prominent Brazilian photographers. And so with a uh, digital art history grant from the Getty Foundation, we worked on this collaboration and it has resulted in a new version of Imagine Rio that really emphasizes uh, even more the importance of uh, uh, visual images in the form of photographs uh, of the history of Rio. And so with this partnership with the Instituto Moreira Sales, we are integrating 4,000 photographs into uh, Imagine Rio. And this has led to some exciting new collaborations uh, such as with Snapshot, um, which is a way in which it's a crowdsourcing tool which allows historical photographs to be geo-referenced um, into Imagine Rio using a 3D model. So this is the new version of Imagine Rio. And as you can see uh, in the new version of Imagine Rio, the images take up, can take up half the screen or more by moving this little slider here. And these images can then be zoomed in on uh, because we're using a, a triple IF viewer for the images. And so for historical photographs, uh, this means that you can zoom into the photographs, which we have in very high resolution from the Instituto Moreira Salas, and see all kinds of details in the photographs that you wouldn't be able to see just by looking at them uh, as they are. And so this has been a very exciting new development. Our new version of Imagine Rio is going to launch, you know, any week now. Um, and again, it's, it's the fruit of collaboration. Okay, so now I want to switch and focus on some of my research um, that uses the ArcGIS side of Imagine Rio, which is essentially the historical GIS behind Imagine Rio. So Imagine Rio is the public version, and now I'm going to show you kind of the back end where I've done my research on water in Rio. And so another of William's questions was, what are some of the most striking insights from your work on urban life and the elements of everyday lives and social interactions? And so studying water in Rio um, from a visual and geographic perspective is really interesting um, because you really see the spaces of the city and the interactions of the city in a new way. And so, there, there is, there, there's a real irony in the history of water in Rio. First of all, despite the name Rio de Janeiro, Rio does not lie on a river. Unlike most cities, which kind of organically grew up alongside of rivers, which was the water source, for better or worse, Rio was not founded along a river. There's no river flowing through it. And so all of the water had to be engineered into the city. And so the irony is 
that the aqueducts brought beautiful, sparkling, clear water down from the Tijuca forest into the city to a few public fountains. And then from those public fountains, um, there is an enslaved labor force that carries the water from the fountains throughout the city. And you see that in the form of both domestic slaves and prison gangs who are also delivering water. And so I think this is really well visualized in this uh, slide that I have for you here. Here you see the Carioca Aqueduct coming down into the city of Rio. This is bringing fresh water from the Tijuca forest. Very few fountains that are concentrated in this end of the city. Um, and then these historical images depict how the streets of Rio were filled with individual water carriers, sometimes chained gangs of water carriers, taking water throughout the city. Okay, so most of my research has started kind of backwards. As a historian, a social historian, I was very used to texts, but this time around, I was starting off with maps and images. And so I came to the traditional sources later. And now they're answering a lot of the questions that came up when I started working with maps and imagery. And so I've been gradually filling in all of the gaps um, in this, um, in my picture of how water is being delivered to Rio through, um, through texts. And I'm starting to get information on the flow of water to the public fountain. So here's an example of uh, a table that I made drawn from uh, information that I found in an almanac that showed what the flow of water was over 24 hours in 1838. And an interesting uh, fact is that when you break it down by parish, you can start to see that the inequality uh, of water delivery in the city was quite pronounced. So one parish, Santa Rita, had no public fountains. And that led to the rise of these water cellar entrepreneurs who began to uh, fill huge barrels uh, at the public fountains and then deliver water through uh, parishes, uh, selling the water uh, as they went. And so this, um, this image here, which is a very, you know, kind of familiar image of water in 19th century Rio, when I found uh, archival information about these water sellers, I learned that they had to be licensed by parish every year. They had to have a little badge they put on their cart, which is this little yellow thing here. Um, and I noticed that the parish with no water, Santa Rita, was also the parish that had the most licensed water sellers that came into the parish. So here is one of my maps showing the delivery of water via two aqueducts and the public fountains to each parish. And you can see up here the parish of Santa Rita has no public source of water in 1838. So now I'm going to jump ahead uh, to 1845 and talk about a historical map that I found very interesting that also posed a problem in georeferencing. So you can see here that this map has been taped together. Uh, so there's something missing in here, I think. In any case, I had to georeference it two times, so once for the city and once out here for the rural areas that went up into the Tijuca forest. Um, and so when it was finally georeferenced, uh, you could, I could see uh, the extent of the aqueducts coming into the city um, and how they were delivering water to the different fountains. And then on this map, uh, there are these series of faint blue lines. And this has to do with a proposal to introduce pipe water into the central city. So harvesting these lines in my, uh, in my GIS, I created a simple little layer that showed the proposed water lines for the central city in uh, 1845. So jumping ahead again another 20 years, um, we start to see that 
the city still has uh, this enormous problem of how to get its water. And so one of the things the city was doing was creating these, what I've marked here as, uh, as uh, blue boxes. These are reservoirs. They're not reservoirs the way we think of them. They're more on the size of swimming pools but they gather water and they store water. And so it makes the delivery of water a little more reliable because before these aqueducts were just like running rivers. They're not, you know, they're not big, they're small, but they're running quite quickly and there's no way to store the water if you don't need it. So adding all of these reservatorios as they're called, um, you know, added to the stability of water delivery in the city. And as the city's growing, water is always a huge problem. And this map is also showing population density by parish. And so you can see here that these parishes in the central city are obviously the most dense, but they're not always the most of the ones that have the best supply of water. Okay, moving again uh, ahead in history a little bit to the 1880s, uh, it became obvious that water from the Tijuca forest was not enough and that Rio was gonna have to find more sources of water. But they used the same model, which was to go to a forest and bring the water down from the forest in a series of aqueducts. But in order to do this, uh, they had to build a whole new railroad. And so what you're seeing in this particular uh, historical photograph is the railway that was built in order to take the materials to build these new reservoirs uh, and new aqueducts uh, up into uh, the mountains. And here is one of the first um, reservoirs that would, was opened. This is a historical photograph from 1885. And this is my photograph from uh, 2017 of almost the exact same place in, um, in, in the forest of Qinghua, which is north of Rio. And here you can see uh, mapping this that the, uh, the new sources of water were very distant from the city. So this was a major uh, effort to build this whole new water system that was going to deliver water to a central reservoir in the city from, from whence it would be piped under pressure to other areas uh, in the city. So this, for example, was one of the, uh, the 19th century aqueducts. The colonial aqueduct by the time this map uh, was made by the year of this map is no longer working, but it was much smaller. So you can really see um, the huge effort that was made to, um, to build uh, these new aqueducts. And at the end, I'm going to show you some of the pipes that were all imported from England. Uh, and I think it kind of adds to what Jim was talking about just a few minutes ago about the linkages to and from London to uh, other parts of the world. In this case, we're going to see the, 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 the pipes that were all brought to Brazil, some of which are still standing because I've seen them with dates of 1904 stamped on them. Okay, so that's a, that's a um, you know, sort of quick overview of some of the work that I'm trying to do, but I wanna get to another one of William's questions uh, about, you know, how complicated this is to do. And I'm, I'm like Jim, I'm doing simple GIS. I'm not a GIS superstar by any means, but imagine Rio is quite complex. And so he, to create something like imagine Rio, you do need collaboration, not just between an architect and a historian and an art historian and a cartographer, but you need the collaboration of people in IT. So for example, here is a diagram that uh, my colleague Fares, the architect made that showed how uh, Imagine Rio worked. This is the public version, not my private sort of backend ArcGIS projects, but this is what was required in order to make the original Imagine Rio run. And the new Imagine Rio is even more complicated. Uh, and so, 
it's not something that an individual historian can do. I mean, yes, there are some individual historians who can do this, but realistically, you need to have extensive collaboration and the support of IT. And you know, this is also reflective of, you know, architects understand how to build things, they understand how to design things. As historians, we're much better trained in how to read documents, how to read the sources, how to piece things together. And so these academic collaborations with the support of IT, I think, are really essential. But that's that's good though, because as we'll see in a minute, all of this leads to an Imagine Rio that's open to the public, making it possible for anyone to do quite sophisticated research and even write from Imagine Rio. So I'd like to turn now to another of William's questions, which is had to do with the publication challenges. Um, and these are serious. Um, I had a very hard time figuring out where to publish my work. Not only is it, does it take a lot longer when you're working in GIS to um, you know, make, do the research, make the maps, uh, and so forth. It's easy to present at a conference, but for a publication, it's much more complicated because you've got this question of how am I going to publish my maps uh, in a way that somebody reading this can really see what I am talking about. And so the, the journal that I started publishing in was ePerimetron, which is a journal not very many people have heard about, but it comes out of the International Cartography Conference. One of the subgroups is on digital cartographic heritage and they had their own journal. And it was very easy to publish in this journal and they were very receptive to accepting illustrations. But you know, academics have to pay attention to who's reading their stuff and you want to try and get into the best journal possible. So uh, finally, we had an article accepted in Urban History, which is in Cambridge Core. And Cambridge Core allows you to have an online version um, in which you can uh, incorporate your images. So this is, these are two images that appear in Cambridge Core uh, for the online version of our article. And you can click up here and see this in nice, you know, full screen. So that's great. Uh, but it's still just working off of PDFs. And so it's a snapshot of your map. It's a snapshot of your images. And another problem with Cambridge Core is that it's very expensive. And you know, we wanted to have readership in Brazil. And you know, people in Brazil don't have access to Cambridge Core. And I had to ask uh, for quite a lot of money from my dean and chair to get this article in, uh, in Cambridge Core uh, public access. So anyone now can read it. You don't have to pay for it. But it, it's so I feel like the academic publication market still has a long way to go. So that took me to story maps. And I was very interested in story maps because um, in Esri story maps, you can include your maps, include your images, write your text. It's a beautiful platform. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. It's really designed for Esri users, the majority of whom are geographers or cartographers. They know how to make maps. And so I uh, collaborated with two colleagues um, who were ha had interesting stories to tell on Rio, but I ended up doing the entire story map. And one of them took you know, months to finish. Um, and I worked, I did story maps with my students, especially during COVID. We did uh, story map projects, both on COVID in Brazil. And this is one on a very famous novel on the history uh, that takes place during, uh, during the time when the, the royal family lived in uh, Rio. But, it, but we needed a, uh, a GIS specialist to help the students make their maps. They couldn't make them on their own. They could write about them, but they couldn't make them. So that led us to this new move with Imagine Rio, which is we are creating our own version of a story map platform that's called Narratives or, of Rio, not Achivas do Rio in Portuguese, that's completely bilingual that was designed by Axis Maps, 
And that's basically going to give anyone the ability to create their own narrative about anything they want in, his, in Rio uh, using the layers of Imagine Rio. And so this, this application uh, is going to have the new version of Imagine Rio on one side, and then the cards that the, the writer is going to design and write on the other. And so what this does is make it possible for anybody to select a year in Imagine Rio, turn on a geo-referenced historical map, upload their own image, write about their own image. And I think that's going to be very exciting. And we've, we've, we've tested it out on a group of 14 historians in Rio who helped us with the final design of the Nada Chivas platform. And I think, um, you know, we, we had a lot of bugs to get through, but they were very excited about it because it meant that they could really zoom in on a particular area of the city that they were interested in. They had access to our layers. This, for example, is one of the aqueduct layers that comes out of my research. Um, they can use a full screen image uh, in, in their story map. Um, and you know, they can zoom in on the uh, images, which, which using the photographs will be really exciting because the photographs from IMS are in super high resolution. So I think that's a really exciting new development. And it, what it really leads to is this democratization of research so that um, now it's possible to see in Imagine Rio all kinds of things um, that, that are at your fingertips, both in terms of the historical maps that we've geo-referenced, the photographs we've geocoded, and our digital map. So right before um, this, uh, you know, this uh, this seminar began, I created this slide from Imagine Rio, and these are the water pipes that were imported from England, and these are all over the city. They, these were all over the city of Rio. This particular photograph happens to be across the Guanabara Bay in, uh, in, in Niteroi, which is a city across the bay from Rio. Actually, no, this is, this is on Niteroi is up here, but this is across the bay from uh, Rio, but showing how water is coming down into the city. So I, I feel like this is a really, um, on the one hand, uh, you know, HGIS, historical GIS is difficult to do but we're making it possible in Imagine Rio uh, for users to use. And I feel like what's really happening is that was, was once a private historical GIS has now become a public GIS. And so in the new version of Imagine Rio, this is another image that I you know, screenshotted just a few minutes ago. We have, these are the, the famous arches from the Carioca Aqueduct that are still standing today in Rio. So here we have a historical image uh, and here we have exactly where the photographer was standing. Sorry, I've got my timer going. My time's almost up. Uh, so here's, here's where the photographer was standing. This is kind of what's in his view and it's mapped out over the city, making it a, a very rich uh, environment for uh, a user of Imagine Rio to use and to think about how the spaces of the city evolved over time. So thank you very much for your attention, everyone. I'll stop my sharing there. Okay, thanks so much, Alida. Um, our final speaker is uh, Colin. Colin, you ready? Yes, I am, uh, and I, I hope that you're all seeing my screen. Yep. Uh, perfect, good. Okay, so I uh, would just like to thank all of you for attending. I've got former students here and current colleagues and former mentors, etc. cetera. Um, and thank you to Willie and Sean for organizing, and thank you to Jim and Alida for um, being here uh, alongside me. I am not going to do a sort of full dive into the Dechima project. Kudos to Sean on correct pronunciation. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but then I'm also going to, uh, 
work with the cues that Willie so kindly gave us, because I'm a firm believer that when given a set of questions that help you organize yourself, that you should follow along with those questions. So I'll tell you a little bit about Dechima, um, which is first and foremost, a, a loan among these projects. It's very much an early modern project. Um, that means that unlike uh, Alida's work and Jim's work, who, who live mostly in the 19th century, uh, I live thoroughly in the 16th, a uh, little bit into the 17th century. Um, so I have seriously different concerns and different data sets uh, and different sort of possibilities um, with GIS. It's, it's very much uh, a sort of different world. Um, if you'd like to sort of have a look at that world, you can visit www.dejima-map.net. We've just done a, um, a web update, uh, a shiny new sort of format of the website. So I'll show you a little bit of what's going on on that side. Um, but primarily what we've done is we have taken uh, a 16th century map of Florence by a fellow named Stefano Buonsignori uh, and a um, collection of 16th and 17th century data sets and kind of put them together uh, as best we can. Um, as with Alita and Jim, I am by no means uh, a fancy GIS um, specialist. My training is uh, very much as a historian. I spent a week at DHSI in 2011 with um, uh, Ian Gregory doing GIS training. And then I spent a week there uh, with Jess Otis doing Python training in 2019. Um, but very much, very much a, um, a historian who's dabbled in and sort of self-taught and you know Googled a whole lot of solutions. Um, we've taken that map of Florence uh, and those various data sets and built them into a public uh, web GIS app. Uh, that allows, this is sort of our, our user guide picture, that allows users to uh, visualize data, to change how data is visualized, to ask questions of data, to look for particular people or places, or to ask the, um, the GIS app to sort data in particular ways. We built a, a series of queries that, you know, for instance, um, will allow uh, you to look for particular professions in the city. The bulk of our data is um, what I call social historical data. That is, it's primarily census data. Almost all of our data sets are right now are, are census based. There's three major censuses, sensei, from the uh, 16th and early 17th century that we have um, transcribed from manuscript form into uh, databases and then uh, geocoded those databases um, however best possible. With two of these, we were able to locate um, entries in the census effectively down to a street level um, so that we, we could at least place the, we, we, we could sort of append to a given street um, all of the census entries attached to it with the 1561 census manuscript in, uh, in part because of its, its sort of idiosyncratic construction as a manuscript, we were able to locate with um, much more accuracy than that, almost down to building level. Uh, we were certainly able to place individual buildings on the map for analysis, um, or at least individual census entries on the map for analysis. This has allowed us to, and I'm just going to give a very brief overview of one of the sort of basic research findings of this project, um, has allowed us to, for instance, create maps of the sort of basic services uh, present in the city of Florence in the 16th century. Here's my, you know, uh, butchers, bakers, and I couldn't find candlestick makers, so I went with barbers instead. Um, and you can tell from looking at where these services and professions are located throughout the city that we have this sort of very regular dispersal of basic services in a, in a 16th century city. When central planning of, of basic services is, is in, in its infancy, uh, if, if even in practice at all. Um, we have, I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, 
I want to I want to jump away from the project now with that very brief sort of nonsensical overview uh, and and sort of step back and talk about how I got here and how uh, GIS work has um, played into and kind of shaped my career. Um, during my MA at Dalhousie University, I was working in a uh, very traditional archival history project. I had 1500 odd petitions um, from around the Duchy of Parma in the 17th century that I wanted to map out um, their provenance from. All these petitions had come from sort of small towns into the, the central city of the, of the province. Uh, and I wanted to sort of map out these petitions to see if there were any thematic patterns that I could identify, such as you know certain heavily petitioned issues uh, popping up in, in particular areas. I had zero GIS experience at the time. Um, and I tried a couple freely available map maker uh, programs, but couldn't really wrap my head around it and didn't really have time. This was towards the end of my MA thesis. Uh, didn't really have time to develop the training and time to get my maps done. So I ended up spending um, several weeks with uh, tracing paper and analog maps um, and a little compass set uh, creating by hand the maps, uh, including proportional dots that showed up in my uh, MA thesis, and I, I couldn't really do any analysis of um, the content of petitions in, in that method uh, at all. So I just ended up doing sort of, well, there are 60 petitions from this town and 12 from that town and et cetera, et cetera. So I had a map that showed, you know, where petitions came from by proportional dot. And I swore after that, uh, that I would never draw maps by hand again. Um, and that the next time I had to engage with maps, it, it would be in some kind of digital mold. Um, I did not realize that I would then, uh, starting, my, starting my PhD the next year, I would immediately be beginning a map-based project, uh, but I fell into it with Nicholas Terpstra, uh, who was my supervisor at the time and remains my um, colleague and collaborator. And we began the, the Dechima project we had on hand this, this lovely, as you can see, highly detailed, um, highly artistic map of uh, the early modern city. And then we had on the other hand, this, this highly detailed, highly locative uh, or locative um, 1561 census. Um, I was thinking strategically at the time, this was in 2010, uh, Having graduated my, my BA in 2008, I was well aware that the job market, um, whatever job market was, was awkward and uh, difficult to get into. And I thought that anything that could sort of give me, um, not necessarily a unique approach, but uh, something that could set me apart was a good thing. Uh, and, and I ended up, I, I have a job because I've done uh, GIS work. Um, and so I began the, the Dechma project uh, alongside my uh, traditional archival 300-page uh, um, dissertation and did these two things sort of on a parallel track uh, through, my, through my PhD, sort of spending time on one when it was more important and spending time on the other when it needed to be done. Um, and that taught me that doing the sort of two things uh, side by side really helped me develop both uh, the intensive sort of historical skills, as well as all the technical skills that I thought I could get away with, um, you know, sort of up to the limit that I thought where no one will complain too much if I don't go any further than this, uh, which is not to say that the sort of GIS specialists don't have uh, things to complain about in my work, um, but that as uh, as Jim and, and Alita have pointed to, there's there's a point at which you say, well, this is this is what I need to use this tool for. And these are the questions that I'm trying to ask of this tool. And so I don't need to get into the, the more intensive um, geoprocessing, et cetera, et cetera. The, that sort of tension there comes um, from the fact that the GIS is both a, a method as well as an established discipline. So there's, there's people like us who are historians uh, who, who use GIS to do our craft, uh, 
um, who used GIS to do historical research and to help us visualize and to help us analyze, um, that we ask questions of us, of it, it in turn prompts us back to ask questions. Uh, we can use it to help us answer those questions, but sometimes, as Jim says, we actually have to go back uh, to the archive to, to answer the questions that GIS has prompted for us. On the other hand, there's, there's the discipline of GIS, which is someone like uh, Dave at Axis Maps that, uh, that, that Alida has worked with, who for them GIS is uh, the be all and the end all, right? The end and the means of their, um, of their work. So we can't be all of those things, right? As historians, we are, we are focused on the method of GIS more than the discipline of GIS because our, our discipline is, it remains uh, tied to historical questions, historical research methods, including archival work. Um, this brings us to sort of, you know, the question of interdisciplinarity that, uh, that Willie has given us. Um, and if you are a sort of GIS minded historian, as Alida has alluded to, um, collaborative scholarship becomes extremely important. Again, not just with you know, an architect or an art historian, uh, but, but with IT specialists, um, with GIS specialists, uh, which then um, allows you to sort of focus on your end of that work, taking the you know, set of GIS skills that, that I've developed or that you've developed, uh, that allow you to answer the questions that you have as a historian, but also then setting aside parts of your project that can be taken further by other uh, members of your collaboration who, who may uh, have a further set of skills in, in, a, in a related area of that project. Um, projects can become bigger when you have a historian and a GIS specialist and an architect and an art historian, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and a dedicated IT infrastructure uh, is also very important. Um, which is not to say that this sort of interdisciplinary collaboration uh, does not present challenges of its own. Um, obviously, collaboration allows projects to become bigger and, and to do more things. You can become really ambitious. Uh, Dechima is part of a multi-institution, multidisciplinary collaboration called Florentia Illustrata, um, sort of under the umbrella infrastructural support of a, of, a, of a center for Italian Renaissance studies at Harvard. Um, and through that, we're combining data sets from about nine different sort of separate institutional projects into a single infrastructure for sharing of that data, for making it talk one project to another, for bringing it into a common framework um, and, and, and a sort of common structure. Um, you can do these really big, uh, ambitious, collaboral or sorry collaborative projects um, you can combine skill sets and interests to leverage everyone without having to invest in everything for instance if i need a 3d scanner um, i can call up one of my collaborators who has a 3d scanner and who has also probably already scanned the environment that i am looking for so sort of collaborative scholarship which is becoming more and more the norm in digital work um, allows us to sort of share responsibilities and not have to take on uh, all of the investments ourselves. At the same time, um, these collaborations prevent or present uh, some significant challenges for project management. Uh, and, and the question of money becomes very important. Uh, as we've learned in our, in our uh, 10 years working with Dechima and trying to establish sort of formalized really does need to be some kind of central management hub of the, uh, of the entire operation. Um, and that one of that management hub's jobs is always going to be uh, keeping on everyone's case about where's your funding coming from, about what's your next grant, about what are you putting in for now. Um, that Having that management becomes a boon to securing funding, it becomes uh, easier to sort of build strength upon strength, right? It helps me to tell Shirk that I have infrastructural support provided by uh, Harvard. Um, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm seeking shirt grants, I can say, look, I've already got funds and infrastructure critically, you know, people and, uh, and tech in place here for this. Um, but it also can end up sort of turning the entire enterprise into a sort of grant seeking uh, 
uh, machine, right? You start to feel like you're uh, kind of like a physicist running a lab and that you're managing this team of researchers uh, and your job becomes, you know, applying for grants over and over and over again. Um, that's not a bad thing. I mean, that's part of doing collaborative digital research, but it is something that as you get more and more into the world of, uh, of, of GIS, larger projects, collaborative projects, you end up in this, um, it starts to feel more like a science lab rather than uh, the, the historian's career you might have envisioned when you were uh, just beginning your, your PhD. Um, speaking of people who are beginning their PhD, uh, and imagining their uh, careers as historians. Um, Willie asked us to think about uh, how the coming generation of early career historians are going to be expected to have um, you know, an ever expanding skill set. Um, as I've said to students uh, and colleagues for a long time, um, almost every uh dissertation these days mm -hmm. is at least based upon a some kind of database so so students are already sort of by necessity and by the the draws of modern research methods are um developing basic digital skills already i do worry that in order to secure positions more and more sort of qualification creep is going to say okay we want someone who's uh, who can teach global and world uh, history, as well as small town American history, as well as doing GIS, as well as Python coding, right? Um, and that, that, as we already see happening in, in job ads, that the sort of uh, expectations of graduating students are going to be higher and higher. Um, it's a bit of a false question anyway, because the job market is, is uh, is crushed right now. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the next 10 years. But I do worry for students that it's going to be, uh, whereas I could just do GIS as a graduating PhD student and people would say, oh, he does GIS. 10 years from now, it's going to be, well, why doesn't he do Python and R and why doesn't he do 3D modeling as well? Um, in terms of um, the sort of broadest approach that I have taken, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of end up very shortly so that we can have some time to, to discuss among ourselves and to take some questions. Um, in terms of the broadest approach to GIS, uh, as an early modernist that I have found to be successful, and I, I think that um, Jim and Alita would probably agree with me here, that it's important to recognize the limits of what you're going to do as a historian and to not let project creep get ahead of you. Um, tackle challenges as they come and do what you can as a historian with a relatively, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm capable of sort of resolving many software problems and I, I've learned how to Google specifically ArcGIS problems and specifically how to Google Python problems, specifically how to Google CSS problems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but very much I know where my limits end and I know that I, I'm going to do what I can and at a certain point I say, okay, here's where I need to hand off to someone else. One, um, this is as, as Jim alluded to uh, in his talk as well, one of the things that we historians uh, face, one challenge we face is, the, is data. Um, historical data is notoriously messy. Um, if you think 19th century data is messy, wait until you see 16th century data in terms of irregular orthography, in terms of uh, irregular um, or inconsistent uh, levels of data across a census, right? For some census entries, we have a full 50 fields of data. For other census entries, there's only four or five that have been filled in. Um, so trying to make what you can of historical data becomes uh, an important exercise. This is very true of how to spatialize that data. Um, in the 19th century, uh, postal addresses were becoming more and more regularized. Uh, this is not true in the 16th century, so we had to develop an original method, um, if a relatively basic method, of auto-computing um, geolocations of 10,000 census entries in, in the 1561 census. We knew where they sat on street corners and we basically filled in a line in between them. 
Um, what we end up with is uh, perhaps the difference between a history project performed or, or done or you know, run through a GIS environment uh, and, and what would be considered sort of a true GIS, where uh, in, in the Dechma project we have sort of prioritized the accessibility and the analyzation of historical data in a spatial context rather than geospatial data um, in, a, in a historical model. And, and I think that's probably, um, it's difficult to go much further than that for 16th century social historical data. There are, there's architectural data and architecturally based GIS projects that are, that are more um, deliberately GIS based than ours, um, but it is, uh, we, we are what we are. Um, one of the things that GIS work has let me do, and I'm, I'm gonna end up, I'm gonna close off here, uh, is, is by, um, it has let me sort of draw students into a public history program in a way that um, I, I, I really wanted to try when I was just beginning my teaching career that I now run uh, an ongoing multi-year um, introduction to digital history course in which students, it's, it's a project-based course in which students every year we pick a year of the um, St. Catherine's tax rolls starting in 1900, we've now done 1910 and 1920, uh, and we transcribe these, these you know, manuscript documents which are um, digitized for us by the Brock Archive. Uh, and we transcribe them into a database and then we map them using ArcGIS Online uh, into um, an online GIS environment. And then we've, we've created uh, a public facing GIS web app um, that allows locals to you know, find their, their grandparents and stuff like that and to figure out where all the carpenters live and stuff like that and where all the well and canal workers live. That's been a lot of fun. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do a project like that if I hadn't, uh, begun doing GIS as a dedicated research tool 10 years ago. Um, and I will, I will simply end by saying that it has uh, certainly shaped my career uh, for the better. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop my sharing. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, we do have some time now to take some questions from the audience. Um, you can post your questions directly into the chat and I'll keep an eye out there. And uh, if anybody's feeling adventurous enough, I think we're a small enough group here uh, that if you wanna use the raise hand function in Zoom to ask a question over video or audio, uh, or both, um, you uh, can do so as well. Um, as we let people think about questions and post them into the chat or, or raise their hands, um, I have a question for um, the panel. Um, after listening to the presentations, <clears throat> I heard the same thing three times, which is we've got no super GIS people here. So I'll turn to Willie for the next one to get only experts on uh, GIS. Um, but it raises an important point <laughs> about all our autodidacts here around GIS that um, I don't think your experiences are uncommon for historians who are using GIS in their research, um, that you are either self-taught or that you've pulled together the resources, maybe done a seminar on, on uh, a programming language or a seminar on using a particular GIS tool. My question is about the future of the use of these tools in urban research and historical urban research in particular, maybe more broadly, just historical research. Um, but is that autodidactic self-taught mode and the direct one-to-one -one direct relationship between historical researcher and GIS tool, do you see that as the potential future? And is that valuable in your own work? Would your work have been impeded or more challenging had you had to work through the intermediary of a technician? Um, so maybe I'll ask Jim to, to start off on, on that one. So, you know, since I started in 2007, the tools have become a lot easier. Mm -hmm. uh, ArcGIS online for a lot of what historians do. I can set up something quite quickly for a student to start putting points on a map and adding a few fields of uh, qualitative or quantitative data to go along with those points. Uh, you know, you can even do this just in Google uh, Earth uh, software or Google My Maps. So I, I, th I think that autodidact approach, you know, 
it's pretty simple to get students up and started. And I've had students in third year classes do really impressive mapping projects uh, during a single semester, whereas it took me 18 months to kind of get to their level uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and I think a lot of, I think all three of us discuss kind of finding questions from the maps. Uh, Alita, you know, really emphasized how she started with maps and pictures and found her questions and went back to the archive. And, and I found that as well. I don't think I would have understood West Ham as well if somebody else had traced the polygons for me. And in fact, I don't understand Greater London's industrial history as well as I understand West Ham because I paid somebody else to find all those polygons uh, once I became a faculty and had shirk money to get students to do some of that leg work. Uh, but actually staring at a map and trying to make decisions uh, is, is part of what prompts these questions. So whenever possible, I still like to do some of this work or a lot of this work myself uh, because it's what gets me to start noticing the patterns of uh, uh, red pine being different from white pine. Uh, that was a little bit in the historiography, but it really wasn't emphasized very well. And when you start putting the points on the map and seeing that there's hundreds of kilometers between uh, the two uh, sort of timber frontiers in the 1820s or 1830s, that forces you to go back and reflect and make that a central question in the research that you're doing. What about for you? Did you have a similar experience having well, first direct hand relationship to the tool as the researcher? Yeah, I, uh, so my GIS expertise began when I arrived at Rice University, but where I was teaching before, um, you know, individual people in geology knew how to do GIS, but there was no public outreach. When I got to Rice, there was a GIS lab affiliated with the library. You know, they offered courses, they helped you. They, you know, they wouldn't make the maps for you. You had to make your own maps. But that was my first experience. I simply wanted to create some old fashioned maps for my books. You know, it's very hard to get a decent map in a publication and I <laughs> wanted to draw my own maps. And so I had to learn GIS to do a simple black and white map. Um, and then as we got involved in Imagine Rio, um, I started going to these uh, cartography conferences on digital approaches to cartographic heritage. And they were all in Europe. There were very few Americans there. But I found the Europeans just way ahead in terms of trying to figure out how to digitize, how to map, how to make accessible their incredible cultural collections. And so it was some of those ideas that inspired Imagine Rio and, how, and why we made you know, it's originally our first idea, Fares is and my first idea was we were gonna have an exhibition. You know, we were gonna get paintings and maps and photographs and have an exhibition in Houston that would coincide with the Olympics in Rio. And we quickly realized that we could do so much more if we went digital. And in a way, what we were doing was not all that original. There's, you know, the, the iconography of Rio has been studied the historical maps have never been collected in the way that we had done so. And, we, and a map of the kind that we created had never been made. But I mean, you ha it gets back to the issue of collaboration. Um, a GIS specialist would never have come up with this project. It was us in conversation with GIS specialists that came up with the project. So I think that you know, that's really, really important. And, and I think, you know, everyone is an autodidact in GIS, unless you're an undergraduate major in geography, everyone's learning it however they can by taking classes. And yes, the students are much faster and it's gotten easier. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like Jim, what, what takes me a long time is quick for the students, but that's great, you know, that opens doors for them. And I think if you, learn, if you learn just a little bit of GIS on a project like this, if you're an undergraduate, it can grow, grow into job opportunities and greater experience in all kinds of fields. So I think it's a great thing for us to offer our students uh, because I do think mapping is, you know, it's just everywhere now and it's good for students to, to, to know about it and be able to do it. 
And Colin, you are working on projects that are at bigger scales that have multiple team members, but you're also directly at the interface of the technology as a researcher. Did you want to comment on any value you see in that? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it helps to, uh, I was a firm believer more when I first began than I am now that sort of digital humanists should have at least a, you know, at least a, a a solid understanding, if not a thorough understanding, uh, of the of the digital tools in the in the side of their digital humanity. I think now th this was also ten years ago, right? As, as Jim says, um, the accessibility was less then, um, and so there was there was a much smaller community of people, and it wasn't as easy to find um, the sort of tech support that would be able to help you, that would get your humanistic thinking. Um, that would that would understand how you how you think like a historian and then help you develop a GIS project along that way. Um, for me, it's allowed me to formulate research projects uh, in in new ways, right? It, so my my latest project um, is based, you know, first and foremost, or my, my latest shirt grant, I guess, um, is is first and foremost uh, like a GIS project that's uh, digitizing, transcribing, databasing, and mapping. Um, police activities drawn from, you know, manuscript court records in the 16th century in Florence, and it's going to be part of the Dechma project, but it is, again, historical research. Um, but if at some point I feel like for publication purposes I need to call in some professional cartographers or something, uh, great, but part of the research is going to be doing the mapping, and that's, that's something I sort of feel like I have to do myself to, to really understand the patterns that I'm seeing and to develop the data along the way as I'm going through. Um, that's for, you know, my article, you know, or, or my monograph. When it comes to a big public history project like Imagine Rio or, uh, or the, the public front end of, of Dechima, um, I think that there's a lot of value uh, to, you um, bringing in people whose specialist is, is user experience or user design or people whose special, you know, whose experience uh, is, uh, is cartography in particular, et cetera, et cetera, to just make the, the product and the experience as good as possible for users. Cause there's things that I always, as a historian, um, am not going to think of from that end. Um, in terms of Alexandra Sarkozy's question, where do I have students use ArcGIS in the classroom? I do, um, both at first at U of T uh, and then at Brock, at U of T, um, I worked with Marcel uh, Fortin, who, who many people here will know, um, to convince U of T to uh, extend ArcGIS licenses beyond the geography department. Um, it used to be the departments individually bought in, um, and I first convinced history to buy in. Uh, and then uh, after that, you, the, the, the GIS library just began offering them to everyone. Um, I have used Q with students. I, it, I'm more familiar with ArcGIS um, and ArcGIS Online. Uh, a lot of institutions have a site-wide license now and it's really um, fairly straightforward to use for students and it's easy to teach them. Um, and I do use it with my students in the classroom uh, in, in a couple classes. Um, and then back to, to Alida's point about, you know, students picking this up even just a little bit can, can lead to further opportunities. There is a student here in the audience who after her uh, dabbling in GIS um, at Brock History and Brock Geography took up a, an internship um, with the city of St. Catharines doing GIS work there. So um, I, I want to pick up on Marcus's question about ArcGIS and QGIS, an open source project and a commercial product, because um, it, it ties to some of the responses we got about you know, improvements in the technology that make it easier to use, that make it easier for a single researcher to just kind of pick it up and start to play around with it. Um, and the reason I ask this question is I'm sort of thinking a little bit further back as historians, you know, if we were with a group of historians in the 1970s, you might be working with a technician who's doing your word processing, or you yeah. might be working with a technician who's helping to create a spreadsheet, um, which I'm pretty sure, and I'm looking for Marcus to nod here, but I'm not sure any of our colleagues today would be, you know, on a line in a shirt grant application for a word processing technician. Um, it's all just done yourself on your computer. And you know, even from 2007, Jim, when you started, it is much more common now just for basically anyone who owns a smartphone to be interacting with digital maps. 
geo-referenced digital maps as well. So I'm thinking about the ubiquity and the commercialization of the software, its relationship to open source software, how we balance those two. And I've heard ArcGIS, and that's also the software that I use in my teaching and my research, but QGIS is the open source project. So I don't know if uh, Alida or Jim have experience with QGIS or other open source um, tools for GIS, how they compare and what you're thinking is about those relationships between a commercial product and an open source product. Well, I can, answer, I can answer quickly. I think Jim has more to say on this. I've never used QGIS, but it's a real problem for us uh, in Brazil. Nobody is going to afford Esri. And even David Heyman doesn't bother with Esri at Access Maps. Um, but we have the support at Rice, and that's what you know Rice is supporting. And so for teaching, I want to teach platforms that students can get help on. So you know, I'm not gonna, I, I can't answer all their GIS questions. I've got too much to do. Um, so it's much better for me to use Esri because the university is supporting it and has a license that all students get to get access to. But I agree it's a real problem and it's a real problem in Brazil um, because, and people are using QGIS. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about GIS getting easier in part that's through the Esri platform, they they put quite a bit of focus in their new tools and making them more user friendly. So that is an advantage in teaching, especially the cloud uh, platform tools. Uh, the upside to QGIS is they work on Macintosh computers and Esri still does not support Macintosh and many of our students uh, are using Macs. So especially during this pandemic year, my colleague Ben Hoy realized that if he doesn't have students working off campus, Q was the way to go. The other big advantage to Q is they can continue to use it after they've left our institutions. But as I said in the comment field, it, 10 years ago, it was a pain to move data between the two. Uh, now Q can read Esri data sets, no problem and vice versa. Um, and most of what you do is just learning the different button uh, or the different menu organization, almost everything, especially that us historians are doing, can be done in either tool. I like the cartography. It's a bit cleaner in Esri. So because I have it, I tend to use Esri, but I could make the same maps uh, using Q. So yeah, especially if we are collaborating with Brazil or India, uh, I ran a workshop in, in India last year. Uh, you know, of course, I was just going to use Q in that situation. And uh, it really is a very solid alternative to GIS, and it's, it's worthwhile uh, keeping it on your computer and, and following it as it gets better and better, uh, and, and including it in our teaching where possible so the students know that when they leave campus and can't use uh, all the Esri products anymore, they still have access to a full GIS. The nice thing is Esri has even become a little bit better, like story maps. You can uh, create story maps without institutional support anymore. It used to be there was just no way to get into Esri without hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. And they've made some of uh, their simpler tools. And again, the ones that are great for students, uh, basically open access. So uh, yeah, I think we're in a very good situation now where we can pick and choose between the two. We can move back and forth. And uh, it's worth showing the students that these other things exist so that if they really get into GIS, they can use that tool when they leave campus. Um, I'm told we can go for another few minutes on questions. So if people do have questions, please post them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, this is a great discussion about access, accessibility of the technology and the relationship between commercialization and, and open source. Um, and I've had my own like tensions around this because there are, I think the, the question about access is, is not as simple as between the commercial product and the open source product because the... Um, the desktop version, let's say, of ArcGIS was something I could never really assign to use in teaching in the classroom because I could never know if students had computers that could even install it. Yeah. Um, and once ArcGIS Online was available, now I had a platform agnostic cloud-based version that every student could run on a, a Chromebook. Um, but it's the commercial product and um, it raises longer term questions about the way in which the commercial product shapes the scholarship, just as I think there were debates about Excel and continue to be debates about Excel and the, the way that the changes that Microsoft makes to Excel have impacts on, on research and scholarship. Marcus, do you want to jump in? 
Yeah, I have a somewhat related question, especially to Jim. We talk a lot about open research data uh, at York, and I, I was wondering whether you also have something that makes the raw data that you base your maps on available to the public. Because I mean, something like uh, your uh, trade flows would be great to be able to correlate uh, to say migration patterns in the census or something like that. Yeah. So, so is there a way for somebody who's not working on your research projects to access, I don't know, a GitHub repository with your underlying data that they can then reproduce, but also use for other purposes? So as many of you know, this is a big priority for the funding agencies as well. So I promise every time I write a shirt grant that I'm gonna share the data and I do. Uh, so I've been sharing my spatial data even before I think Shirk paid for it, but they definitely paid for all those uh, extra beyond West Ham factories to be discovered and, and referenced. So I quite early shared that. I think in the HGIS community, there's been a long standing tradition of emails going back and forth and saying, can I have your Great Plains database, uh, Jeff Comfer? And Jeff Comfer has sent that zip file or you know, maybe a USB stick in the mail originally. Uh, so different people have, you know, we've been sharing data informally through uh, email networks and conferences for a few decades now. Uh, but I, I do really encourage people to build it into the grant from the beginning, see it as a research output. And hopefully we can even get to the point where we're kind of clearly citing each other's databases. And then we can bring that to our, our deans and our uh, tenure promotion process and say, you know, I've published these articles, but I've also made this really rich data set available and it's being used in these three other projects uh, who are, are citing this data set. You know, I don't think it's going to be there for, for my promotion uh, process. We're, we're still kind of in the infancy, but I think that's something we can establish. Uh, and, you know, I think maybe big projects like Collins are in a position to do that as well, where you can really track who's using these open data sets that you guys are creating these open tools and then make that case in uh, your tenure promotion that, that the journal articles are not the only contribution you're making. I mean, to add to that, in my recent uh, tenure process, um, I was able to, as you say, right, I mean, we've got Google Analytics installed on the Dutchman website, so I can say, it has an average of X number of users a month who spend X amount of time on it from X number of countries visiting X number of pages, right? And um, I'm sure that I could through Esri uh, do even more fine grained um, user data analysis than that, but I, I, I didn't think it was necessary to. Um, I don't know about the American context, but Canadian schools, I don't think are afraid of this stuff in the same way that they used to. Like, I didn't have anyone ask me any questions about the level of, 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 you know, traditional article publications versus uh, digital outputs on, on my tenure file. And, and, and that question Marcus raised about open data and repositories is, is really key for what I think has made GIS more accessible is to be able to dip into and build upon past projects. But again, it plays with that tension of ease of use. So uh, I recently built a, a, a GIS project using some layers out of Esri's um, uh, shareable layer database. And a bunch of projects going back to the 90s have been uploading their data into it. So I found a bunch of data from Georia, which was a University of Toronto geography department Yay. project. They dumped all their stuff into it. I've never used Georia. It was living on some website built in the 1990s. You can download the layers, put it in yourself. But once I was able to just go into a search box and search like 1878 Toronto, and it pulled up all of these different maps from all these different projects, then I was able to really mobilize it, drop it into to my map really quickly, throw it out if I didn't like it. Um, and so I think it starts to become a question for researchers, where do you put it? Do you put it on your institutional repository, GitHub? Do you put it in something like Esri's databases? And where is it most likely to be used? The thing about Esri's database is that it, uh, that kind of accessibility um, or, uh, or public ownership of data is really built into its um, interface that in order to, you know, in order to have the Decima web app be publicly accessible, you have to uh, publicly share all of the underlying data. Yeah. Right? You, you can't have someone be able to access your data through your cool little app that you've built 
without also being able to go into ArcGIS themselves, grab all your data and download it and do whatever they want with it, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, so, and I think that has been largely true of uh, GIS approach to data for a long, long time. That that sort of publicly public accessibility of, of geo data has been uh, sort of an ethos of the of the of the field. Um, that has been, you know, collected under the proprietary care of of Esri. So there's there's a tension there, right? On the one hand, it's all publicly accessible. On the other hand, it's also all been turned over for stewardship to this uh, large corporation. Um, I, I mean, in terms of, you know, data managing corporations, Esri uh, is, is on the nicer end of things. They've at least shown, uh, they, here in Canada, at least, Esri Toronto is um, really invested in, in GIS education uh, and GIS for education. And so they've worked with us. You know, we've worked directly with Esri um, a few times over the years where we have a particular challenge that we're trying to tackle. Um, and they, you know, they just did a whole bunch of 3D modeling for us, which was nice. Um, but, but there is that, that sort of tension between, you know, they make everything public, but it's them making it public. Mm -hmm. But it is, I think, some of the most interesting potential for GIS, because if a researcher or a research team is missing some kind of expertise, let's say you're just making points and polygons, as Jim was saying, but you don't know how to do georectification, how many times does someone need to georectify that 18... 98 map of West Ham, oh, exactly really just that. once if you do it well. Um, Jim doesn't need to do that all over himself. And so he can kind of build from there. And then I guess for thinking about scholarship and if, I guess for geographers, this is old news and scientists, I suppose this is old news, but it's more than just citing someone else's work, right? Like someone else's work then lives on in a really generative way into a new project, um, as opposed to just being a citation that you reference or an idea that shapes your thinking, it actually becomes embedded within your new work, almost like a snowball um, as it goes along. And this is, um, this is part of how we designed Detriment as well, is that it was meant to be a, a data repository that people could then run their own work through. It's been more difficult than I, than I expected to you know, convince people to go ahead and use it and write their own uh, research projects using Detriment data, right? But it, it happens. Right. Absolutely. Sometimes yeah. they need some handholding. Um, I'm going to turn things back over to Willie because we've gone over time here and I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much of everyone's time this afternoon. So Willie, I'll uh, let you wrap things up. Oh, thanks very much. And I, I, I hate to, I hate to wrap things up because this, this has been absolutely stimulating and, and very rewarding, I think. Um, but I'd like to sincerely thank our moderator and our th three presenters for what were three uh, truly illuminating uh, presentations. Um, it's heartening that our presenters have given us uh, their, uh, you know, nothing too fancy kind of disclaimers uh, so, that, but so that we can see what's truly possible in, in terms of um, research and teaching where, where GIS is concerned. And besides the three cities themselves, um, we've learned a lot about the origins of our presenters' uh, projects, their own trajectories in terms of building up their skills where GIS is concerned. And I think we've, we, we can all agree that the results have been very striking uh, and, and, very, and very stimulating. Um, so uh, a, hearty, a hearty thanks to, to Sean, to Colin, to um, Alida and uh, to Jim. Um, thanks also, also to Hazel uh, Dizon, the city coordinator for her work with the poster and for promotional activity. Uh, thanks to all of you out there for your attendance and your participation and have a great weekend and remain healthy everybody thanks, thanks so much for coming out everyone thank you everyone bye bye